So is there a presentation again? Applicants representatives. So I have given co-host permission to uh, Michael Leo to, I think, who will present for the applicant. Um, so um, Michael, you have the ability to share your screen if you want to do that for a short presentation. Great, thank you. Tom is going to actually present. I'm going to okay. put up stuff as we go. Thank you. Okay. So he should be all set, but you're muted, Tom. Not anymore. Right. Thank you. Should I begin? Yes, please, Tom. Go right ahead. My name is Tom, Tom Lesser. I'm from the law firm of Lesser, Newman, Alio, and Nasser in Northampton. And I have the pleasure of representing Jen Pollins, the applicant. She's here tonight for a site plan review. The reason she, he, she's here is that the recent revisions to the Northampton zoning bylaws allow two units, dwelling units, on a single lot, but site plan approval is required. And in this case, the applicant is requesting that she be allowed to have a, an accessory dwelling unit as her second dwelling unit in an existing structure on her lot. Like to make it clear, there will be no exterior changes to the existing structure. There will be no extensions to the existing structure. There will only be interior changes. Now we understand that the proposal will also be required to be approved by the Zoning Board of Appeals but the applicant has chosen to come to the planning board first. The property in question is located at 32 Maple Street. It consists of number one, a single family dwelling in which, in which Ms. Pollins lives. And number two, a structure which was constructed by permit in 1999 which consists of a garage and a studio. It's labeled garage in the site plan, which I've submitted and which Michael will be putting up on the screen for you to look at. Hopefully. Oh. So this is a site plan that was prepared by Randy Iser. You can see Maple Street at the bottom. You can see the single family dwelling closest to Maple Street. You can see what's a shared driveway on this plan. It begins on the property of the neighbor. Then it's depicted in cobblestone and the cobblestones are primarily on the property of Ms. Pounds. In back of that is the unit that we're, the, the structure that we're talking about. It's labeled, quote, garage, end quote, but it consists of a two bay garage and the studio in question. The shared driveway is by a recorded easement in the Hampshire County Registry of Deeds. In order for you to get a better sense of how the structure appears on the ground, I'm now gonna put up three photographs one by one of the garage, quote garage, end quote, 
and describe them to you. This is the structure that we're talking about. On the right, you can see a fence and where that fence ends, Miss Pollen's land ends. There are two bays in the garage and the structure will remain exactly as it is if you grant permission for the back part of this structure to be used as an accessory dwelling unit. Now, the second photograph shows a vehicle parked on the cobblestones to the left of the driveway. And I think you will see that in a second from Michael. Here it is. As you can see, this is the area where Ms. Pollins actually often parks herself. There's ample room in back of her for other vehicles to be parked in that direction without blocking the right garage bay, which could be opened and used or someone could park in front of it. The third photograph, which Michael's gonna put up, shows that from another angle, shows that from her porch. You can see her vehicle parked and you can see there's ample room for at least two more vehicles in front of the left bay and a vehicle in front of the right bay and it could be as many as, if the bay was used, it could be as many as five vehicles. In any case, there's ample parking on site for the number of vehicles which are going to be used. And I would note that the Northampton zoning requires spaces for three vehicles. Now, it's Ms. Pollan's intention to turn the area which was labeled unit on the first, on, this, on the, um, the site plan, it's labeled garage actually. And I'm gonna put up now a, a document which is, which shows the use of that structure. As you can see in the front, there are two bays for cars. And in the back is the area labeled unit. This would be the unit that would be used for the accessory dwelling unit. I would note that there is currently labeled in there um, existing bathroom fixtures. And I tell the board that those were put in without the approval initially of the building inspector. She admittedly constructed them too soon. She was issued a cease and desist order about two years ago. And by agreement with the building department is waiting to see whether or not the accessory dwelling unit is approved. If it's approved, the building inspector will then, the building department will do then do their inspection. And if it's not, if it's required, the bathroom would be removed. Now, Ms. Pollan's next door neighbor, or perhaps two, object based on parking and the use of the driveway. But as you can see, there's ample parking for at least four cars on the cobblestones. Again, Northampton zoning has spaces for three vehicles. It easily meets that requirement. There's been a suggestion from one of the neighbors that she should create additional parking on a quote parking pad end quote on the other side of the building. But that's unnecessary. 
It would create more pavement. It would deprive the area of green. And it would, in fact, be dangerous as people backed out onto Maple Street. Since parking is an issue, I'd like to show you a video now which shows the parking in live time. Which Michael's going to put up in a second. Are you not able to see her right now? Well, I guess we're not going to have we're not going to have the video, but I just point out again where the sideline is of Miss Pollen's lot. If you look at the garage and you look at the fence, the end of the fence is the sideline of her garage, and you can see the car parked, and you can see the ample space for parking. Now. There is a require. There is seven requirements to for approval of a site plan, and I'd briefly go over those one by one. The first is that the project will quote protect adjoining premises from seriously detrimental uses. I'd suggest that there will be no detriment let alone seriously detrimental uses, because the building itself is not changing in the slightest. The footprint's gonna be the same, the outside will look the same, and the entranceway of the present garage and studio will not change. And Michael, could you put up a view of the studio area at this point in time. This is a view of the studio area from Ms. Pollen's backyard. If you look to the right, that's where the garage is, at the right of this structure. The back of this structure is the studio office area that's presently used. So there will be, and the entranceway will remain exactly the same and it's to the opposite side from the neighbors. The second thing, second requirement is that it will minimize and mitigate traffic impacts. That would mean traffic on the street to me. Right now, it's used as a studio, office, friends come over, people come over as a accessory dwelling unit, there's a requirement of one car, but if, even if there are two cars, two cars are not going to impact Maple Street. The third requirement is the location that, that, that will pr promote a harmonious relationship of structures and open space. Since the building is not changing, there'll be no change in the relationship of the structure to the open space. The fourth is that it protect the general welfare. I'd suggest that accessory dwell units protect the general welfare by helping, helping to alleviate the shortage of housing in Northampton as the recent passage of zoning showed. The fifth is the overloading and mitigating impacts on city resources. This will have no relationship on city resources and the last one is it promotes city planning objectives. And I suggest by creating more housing, it will create that and it will meet all sustainable guidelines. The accessory dwelling unit is now allowed by right, but it does need planning board approval. And that's what we're asking for tonight. And I'm happy to answer any questions the board might have. Are there any questions from the board before we move on to um, comments from other folks here? Clarifications for the applicant? 
George, I just, if I could just clarify one item. Um, this property is in the urban residential Bay district, which has allowed two families for decades. So the recent rezoning just swapped detached units from um, zoning board special permit if they were less than 900 square feet over to planning board for site plan review. But nevertheless, two families have been allowed um, for a, a very long time in this district. Thanks, Carolyn. Could you remind us what the dimensional requirements are? Sure, for, um, for two, two units on a property, um, the minimum lot size is um, 3,750 square feet. This lot is a, about a half an acre from our assessor data. Um, typical setbacks are required to be um, 10 feet from the front, 20 from the rear, and 15 from either side. This is an existing um, workshop studio space, which is allowed to be four feet from the side lot line. So changing it to a new use would require a residential use to be 15 feet from the side property line. Um, but given that the house already is non-conforming, it sort of puts it into this whole other category under which the Zoning Board of Appeals can review um, expansions or modifications to pre-existing non-conforming um, structures. So that's why it also triggers the Zoning Board uh, review and um, the next public hearing for the Zoning Board would actually be on August 12th to look at that issue. They, did, they look at the pre-existing non-conforming side setbacks of the structure as the applicant presented is just over about five feet from the lot line instead of the required 15. But again, because the house is already non-conforming and doesn't meet that 15 foot side setback, that's why it puts it into the special, special permit category. Um, this has come up on several other occasions in front of the zoning board previously, particularly when um, they, um, it's also happened for the zoning board for garage spaces that were considered accessory dwelling units that fell under that 900 square foot threshold. So the zoning board would look at that time at two permits um, simultaneously. And now um, given the shift to planning board, this is a planning board and a zoning board permit and they're distinct permits so with distinct jurisdiction. And what have they said in the past? What is what has the zoning board said in the past about this? No, they have not looked at this property and there's no, um, any, uh, each special permit, each special permit has its own unique characteristics. So it's not um, determinative. Well, of, it, yeah, but it, it helps us look at it. So, I mean, what if, what if, oh. what if, what sure. if the property is closed? Yeah, I mean, they, uh, um, there have, I can give you example, uh, let's see, a couple of examples off the top of my head of a, property with an existing garage that was converted to an accessory dwelling down on Aldridge Street. I think that in that case, the garage was actually maybe two or three feet from the lot line. Um, and they granted the special permit for that change to a full, like up in, I think it was a two-story apartment unit. There was another instance in the last couple of years in another neighborhood, um, a very similar situation, a detached garage conversion to residential. Um, again, because they were already sort of the property, the house was already in that non-conforming state. So the board has approved um, these in the past. So, and, and what, what was there one more question? What is to stop, like if we were to say yes, and then she decided that, or he, she, whoever it is, decided that they wanted to um, build a larger, expand onto this thing, would that, when, once we say it, okay, does that just open that, that gate? No, well, what you're reviewing is exactly what's in the application. So you're reviewing an application that is just a trans, 
um, transition within the four walls. Um, so if the owner wanted to put an addition on, that would trigger a site plan amendment because you're approving a certain layout. It also would require another review by the zoning board because it would be considered an expansion of that non-conforming structure. So there, again, there would be two, a two permit process for any um, physical expansion of the space in the future. Right? What you're approving is what's been submitted and that's the limit of what would be allowed. Yeah, but that doesn't open, but, but by doing that, it's not creating just more of a, I understand that the two more things have to happen, but it's not a rubber stamp for the future. No, no, it would be a brand new, it would be a brand new okay. review under those circumstances. Carolyn, this is George again, and, and I apologize if my audio is scratchy. It's all this water in my pipes, I think. Um, <laughs> but just back to the ZBA process, the ZBA process and the planning board, if, uh, Traditionally, I think the ZBA usually has ruled prior to an application reaching the planning board, and this time it seems to be flipped. If we just, for, for instance, if we grant approval to this application, won't that kind of uh, um, influence the zoning board's deliberations in some ways? No, it's completely distinct jurisdictions. The, uh, many times you see it after the zoning board only because it's been coordinated to be on the same night and they meet earlier. So the zoning board might have met at 5.30 and your meeting was at seven. That doesn't mean that's because it has to happen that way. Um, if you say yes, the zoning board absolutely can say no. You know what? This building is too close to the lot line. There are too many issues involved. What you're looking at is a detached unit and whether how it functions on the site, whether it meets all the technical standards within the zoning for that. And uh, some of that piece is, is um, r relates to the new um, um, two family by right standards that the, that the city council recently adopted. And, um, you know, that's a couple of pages worth of um, um, design and layout and, and, um, and um, standards for heating. Um, there's a lot of debate during the city council um, about whether or not, you know, by allowing these that trigger site plan. Um, should we be requiring, for example, um, electric heat sources that could ultimately become um, uh, um, reliant on renewable energy? But this, um, but again, so those standards are all things that you need to consider. But given that this is an existing structure and there are no physical changes being proposed, everything is really about changing the internal use and the heating systems are there the other components of um, the space have already been completed. Many of those things aren't applicable in the situation as they would be applicable for a brand new construction and new um, site disturbance. So um, planning board is focused on those details that are in 6.11, I think the number is, um, for um, new two families by site plan. Um, and then the zoning board looks more particularly about the step at the step. Thank you very much. So if the planning board members are satisfied at this point, we'll get another bite at the apple. Why don't we turn the podium over to any comments or questions um, from folks in the audience. So if you would raise your hand physically or via the toolbar at the bottom of the Zoom panel, that would be helpful. And the chair will call on you um, in turn. So is there anyone who would like to speak? May I speak? Go ahead, Mr. McLaughlin. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is John McLaughlin. I'm with the law firm of Green Miles Lipton. Uh, we represent Kathy Robinson at 38 Maple, which is the immediately abutting parcel. Um, it's not just the abutting parcel, it is the parcel that owns the land on which the driveway exists that accesses the, the garage. Um, I, I wanna say that um, uh, the, there was no application for ZBA that I saw, and um, I don't know if there would be any talk of the ZBA if, I, if my client hadn't gone through the effort of hiring me and having me file a, an opposition motion that said, hey, you guys have to go to the ZBA, because um, not all garages can become houses. I mean, there are, there are certain, I understand the, the um, ordinances that were passed in the past year and uh, where there's gonna be two dwelling units on a single lot, even a 50 foot lot, but not all garages make good homes. Uh, and uh, also I wanna point out that, I don't know if it would have ever been raised before this board that this applicant had tried to construct this without any approvals, without any permits, without any, any plumbing permits, without any electrical permits until it was discovered. Um, and you should bear that in mind when my clients uh, talk about their concern and they're wanting to make sure that everything uh, is above board here and that everything uh, can can fit with the, our bylaws because there's some history here that you got to remember. And again, that wasn't mentioned in the application and that I doubt would have come up if I hadn't you know, has brought this to the board's attention. Um, so, I mean, the the issue that I see is I'm glad to hear that they, they agree now that they have to go to the Zoning Board of Heels, Appeals. I would suggest that you wait for the Zoning Board of Appeals because the ZBA could put conditions on this that could be contra to any conditions or approvals you give. So I, I would wait for the Zoning Board of Appeals. I mean, the issue before the Zoning Board of Appeals is that is, we would compare the use of this property as a residential accessory use to the uh, existing dwelling for a studio. Compare that with it becoming another home on the same property. Um, and indeed, a home could have two cars for one bedroom, guest cars, and if there's comings and goings with guests, uh, um, you know, multiple uh, uh, tenancies one after another, this could create a uh, significant amount of traffic. Um, and substantially detrimental isn't a fatal thing, like catastrophic. It's just detrimental. Is it substantially detrimental? It's not something that's impossible to prove before a ZBA. It's done. And um, I would wait to see what the ZBA says before you dwell, before you deal with the issue of site plan approval. Um, um, there's sort of concurrent jurisdiction now that you admit that there's concurrent jurisdiction, but um, you could end up with conflicts. You could end up with um, conditions of findings from the ZBA differ with what you do tonight. And I would suggest you simply wait. Um, now, as for the uh, site plan approval itself, um, this board, I, I want to make this clear, the board has the power to do more than simply rubber stamp uh, what the zoning bylaws, excuse me, the ordinances say. Yes, there's a minimum requirement. You have site plan approval. This isn't as of right period. This is a, this is site plan approval with as of right use. So what works is do you clearly have the power to look at your site plan approval criteria and decide if you think that this is the a sufficient um, case where you might have to do more. So there's plenty of case law. There's a, a case uh, called uh, Muldoon versus Planning Board of Marblehead. And what that makes uh, clear is that site plan approval is existing in any statute. It's not from the Commonwealth. It's a creature of every single town by law or every single city. It's. And it's up to the cities or towns what they site plan approval. And the site plan approval of three can go beyond the minimum set forth in the bylaws when they approval. They can't really say no. The Zoning Board of Appeals no, that, that, that this garage isn't a good house. But you have to look at it and say, okay, we can't go, but we want to make the bit more with the neighborhood. And I, I do want to say that the, um, the, the traffic provision you have clearly deals with traffic on the site, not just 
the traffic on the neighboring streets. It says it right in it. So dealing with the traffic on the site is clearly something you have the power to do something about. Um, and my client, as I said, owns the road, owns the driveway. The driveway is only for pass and repass. It's not for parking, unloading. It's only for pass and repass. And there's already been problems. And um, it, when you look back in, in the back, say, first, first off, they hardly ever use the garage for, as a garage. So most of the cars are out there. Quite frequently, there's four cars out there now before this. So once there is an approval to make this a home back there, there could easily be two cars plus the guest car, two cars and a guest car, or more than that, you, you need more space. And you have the power to simply say you need a couple extra spaces. If the ZBA says you can even do this, which we hope they don't, but if they do, you have the power to say um, under uh, 350.11.6b, that deals with dealing with the convenience and safety of traffic on the site. And you could say you need a couple more spaces. I know people may have been out there now and looked around. Think of it in January of February, where there's large snow banks on the street because this could, if you don't deal with it, it's not like you're not going to have cars. They're just going to park on the street. And um, if you also uh, think of the parking inside the uh, the um, parking areas with mounds of snow, it's going to be extremely difficult. So, um, my clients believe that it will be uh, seriously detrimental. It will not be for the convenience and safety unless you deal with the parking and traffic issue. And all we're asking for is that you, ZBA approves this, is that you ask for a couple more parking spaces. Clearly have the power to do that. I know the, the city uh, planning department may disagree with me, but the case is clear. You can do this. You have the power to do this. If all it was was, okay, here we are, plan approval. What are the minimums? The minimums to give them site plan approval. The inspector could do that. You have a very good inspector. He could do that. You have the power to deal with issues that are the problems with this particular property. This particular property is five feet away from the neighboring property, and it doesn't even have its own driveway. If ever there was a situation where maybe traffic and park something that you can go beyond the minimums, this is it. And we would ask you to do I would also, again, ask you to see, what, see if they even get by the BA. We're going to argue that it is substantially detrimental. Like I said, detrimental. I mean, catastrophic doesn't mean deadly, it's detriment. And if this is more, substantially more than what's there now, they may find that it is substantially more detrimental. I ask you- Thank uh, you, Mr. McLaughlin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there someone else who would like to come to the mic, the podium? Mr. Hardy? You got on mute. Okay, I have four issues, which I will hit upon very briefly. I'd like to reiterate there are existing parking issues currently. It is, I have a good view of their driveway. Um, it is not uncommon for Jen's boyfriend's oversized van to be parked half in her parking lot. I'm, half, I'm half sorry, in. Mr. Hardy, if I may interrupt for one moment, could you just give us your address and I'm the abutter that's five feet away. Center. It's 12 West Center. Thank what? you. Okay. He says fine. May I continue? Please go ahead. Okay, so there's there are frequently cars parked from anywhere from overnight to 10 to 15 minutes on Kathy Robinson's right of way, which Jen's not allowed to do. And although the pictures of the parking lot were quite impressive, if you actually go and stand in the parking lot, you will realize there is no way for six cars to be parked in that parking lot. And in fact, they have problems when just the van and the car are there. <clears throat> and also, as far as service vehicles and emergency vehicles, if the parking lot's full of four, five, six cars, what access is there for service vehicles or emergency vehicles, which are required by zoning, without, again, relying on the neighbor's property to be used as the staging for said services? Mm -hmm. So the parking issue remains one. One is the nature of the right-of-way. It was created 
when zoning stipulated that since Jen has less than 100 feet of frontage, she could not build additional dwellings on the property. So there was the implicit assumption that it would be that the right of way would be used by one residence. I think should the planning board decide to change that, there would be necessitated some arbitration and renegotiation of the terms of the right of way. Um, there is the issue of our five foot setback, which I see as a zoning board issue. Uh, you know, this apartment is literally in our backyard. Five of the six windows look out onto our backyard where we eat, entertain, etc. The last issue is, um, and this is for the planning board to think of as they move forward. I took around a walk around the neighborhood, down West Center to Park, to Pine Street, to Beacon, and down Middle Street. There were 28 detached garages. We have, th with Kathy Robinson's barn and my detached garage, we have three within 20 feet of each other. Does the planning board want to open the development to that sort of numbers within this neighborhood, which is really defined by people having ample backyards? Uh, I also would encourage the board in closing to postpone their decision until after the Zoning Board of Appeals hearing. That is all. Thank you. If anyone uh, thank question. you very much, Mr. Hardy. Thank you. Anyone else who'd like to speak? Mr. Mr. Lesser again? I, I would just suggest Mr. that. I, I would just say that there you could see the photographs for yourself. Um, Wide angle lens. The photograph speaks a thousand words. There's ample space for many vehicles in that cobblestone parking area, which is all on her property. We have all the information before the board today and tonight. And I've talked to Carolyn and Mish about you reaching a decision before the Zoning Board of Appeals. And she agrees that the jurisdiction is separate and there's no reason to postpone it. And that's just a delay tactic. We'd like to move on with this and not have to come back months from now as we've heard all the information tonight. Thank you. Let's, let's go to the planning board. We go back to the planning board. May have any questions? The applicant, questions for Carolyn. Mr. Mr. Chairman, may I be heard on something? Hold on just a minute, Mr. McLaughlin. I want to just make sure our planning board members don't have any clarification at this point. Thank you. It, it, it seems like there's a, this issue of uh, parking in the shared driveway. I mean, has it ever has it ever led to someone's car being towed? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Yeah. Have you ever had their car towed? No, I don't believe car it. No, I don't believe it. No, no. My my client my client it's is. Never been, yeah. It's never been so egregious that that it's led to that. No, my my client would contact the uh, the the homeowner before they would tow a car, and you know, upon contacting him. Uh, People have acted accordingly and responsibly so far. But it, it, it does... I'd like to respond to that saying that we're a pretty tight community and we don't tow each other's cars. Right. <laughs> well, you are also at a planning board opposing your neighbor's thing. So, I mean, it's not. Out of the question. 
if I could res respond, I mean, I, 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 they did hire me to do an opposition and understand, it, but for the opposition, we wouldn't even, somebody could have built this garage five feet away without zoning board approval. I mean, it was, it was only the opposition that brought this up or that brought up the fact that the applicant tried to do this without your approval, without any permits at all. I mean, bear, bear that in mind. I mean, this is not your regular, oh, you know, I, I want to do something out back with my house and build a, this is, this, there's a, you know, the, the applicant comes here with some history. Um, and, you know, they were saying, why don't we do this now? Uh, as if that it's, it's okay to deal with the zoning board. They weren't even talking about the zoning board. People were ignoring it. And, and so I, I really, also I believe there are numerous uh, responses in writing that were made by other neighbors who are in opposition to this. Uh, I would hope that those are either read by the board or maybe read into the record because I, I believe, I don't know if you know it happened, but I believe there were other neighbors and I think they're all in opposition to this. Um, I don't know if, uh, if Mr. Chairman, if you are aware that there have been other letters written, and they may have been written in the past 48 hours, past couple of days, I don't know. But I believe there were other people who had said that they were in opposition to this and were going to write. I don't know if they did or not, but I believe there are other letters in opposition. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure going before the ZBA is not easy. Uh, I've, I've had... Uh, ZBA grant um, a zoning, uh, you know, a, a finding that they should never have granted. Anyone who could read the English language would say they shouldn't have granted, and they granted it. And I and I went up on appeal to the land court, and what happened while I was on appeal in land court, they changed the bylaws to make up for the fact that they should never have granted it. But I, I know the board is inclined to support development, but, you know, this is an unusual case. This garage is right on top of the property, and it doesn't even have its own driveway. This is a chance where the zoning board really could say no or could put significant and substantial conditions on the finding. Other, you may end up with you know, incongruous decisions and there's no urgency to, to move forward. Um, my understanding is it's already built. Who know, you know, hopefully it's not being used, but it's already built. They're just looking for approval now that you know, your building inspector determined that it was built. Um, so I, I don't think there's any harm in waiting. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. McLaughlin. I think your restate your other previous were well made. Um, is there any new information that would like to come from anybody here before we deliberate about uh, closing the public hearing? I would just say that it makes no sense to put this off because the ZBA could say, well, I'm waiting for the planning board to decide. This incongruity makes no sense at all. We, the site plan has certain things to decide, which are different from the things Unless we're now. I move to close public comment. Our, a motion made I, to close I, comment. Is there a second at this point? And George, I want to point out that the applicant has had her hand raised and she has not yet had a chance to speak. So I would say that uh, before yeah, we close public I, comment, I we should away. have a chance to hear from the applicant. Yeah, I take that away. <laughs> Hi, thanks. I want to take you, much time. Is that okay? Okay. Um, just two things. I feel a little misrepresented. There's never been four cars parked in, in my parking pad. Um, and I don't think there's any other opposition besides what you've heard tonight. To um, and also I've talked to my neighbors and they're actually fine with everything. Um, but also um, just, we're not trying to avoid anything. We just under the guidance, you know, of, of, um, yeah. of Carolyn, as we've been moving forward, we, we've just gone this in, in this order and we have uh, uh, August, I don't know, Carolyn, what's the date, August? 15th date, 12th date to move forward. So we're moving uh, forward now as we should be. And um, that's all I wanted to say, just those two, those two things. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Then give the floor.
George, I didn't catch that. Your connection is still really bad. Yeah. Yeah. Some someone make them to close public hearing. I I move to close public comment. I'll second that. All in favor? The motion. Um, George, do you want me to run through the roll call? Thank you, Karen. That was great. To be okay. Um, so Sam Taylor moved to close. Melissa Fowler, I have a second. So um, uh, Melissa, how do you vote? Yes. Um, Chris? Uh, Sam? Yes. Uh, Jana? Yes. And George Cohen? Was that a yes, George? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I had that as a unanimous yes to close by all members. Um, and um, George, are you back on audio? I am. I'm back on audio. To what degree? I don't know. Any other things from the planning board regarding parking, the access to the driveway, the uh, move to zoning of appeals after this hearing, or are there any conditions that we believe should be put upon on the? Um, I have a couple of comments. I just wanted to so. DPW didn't have any concerns. They submitted um, uh, no concerns. And then just to remind the board and the public that um, a second unit, um, if it were attached to the property, would be allowed by right without site plan approval. Um, and um, it would just go straight to the planning board. So the reason why it's in front of you is because it's detached. So, so long as the applicant could show that they were meeting parking on site um, and the um, unit was attached then, and if it were, even if it were new construction, it's not just if it were reconfiguration of an existing structure on the property, that would be by right because it's urban residential B, it's right next to Florence Center, which is why this area is urban residential B. So I just wanted to um, confirm that. I have a couple of clarifying like uh, questions about sort of um, policy, one related to the easement and one related to the concerns raised about uh, the construction that happened prior to the granting of any permits that resulted in the cease and desist. So mm -hmm. relative to the easement, uh, this is the first time that I recall hearing about an easement that had specific uses attached to it. So not just shared access, but actually coming and going and not loading and unloading and parking. Um, so I guess I just wanted to, to clarify that there is actually a distinction in, in what easements allow to that level of granularity, um, first of all. And second of all, I just wanna understand the extent to which it's possible or appropriate. I'm not saying that I necessarily would, but I wanna understand given the information about the, the past activities pre-permitting, whether or not that should or could have any um, weight in this decision if we're allowed to have that, uh, or if this needs to be a sort of without prejudice uh, judgment. Sure, so I, I mean, I can tell you that, um, I know the applicant submitted information about the easement. It's not, um, it's fairly common to have you know, shared driveway easements for the purposes of passing um, or accessing a property um, without um, necessarily um, granting rights for parking. So that's not, and even in your shared driveway um, permit, um, 
um, that you look at, that's typically what a driveway and an access driveway is about, is about allowing, you know, access. Um, but that is a, you know, that's a, a private matter between two parties. If someone is violating that or overburdening the ease, easement, it's uh, um, up to the other parties that are um, subject to that easement to sort of negotiate that and figure that out. Um, but you see that there's parking on the property itself. Um, and um, so that's what your purview is because you're required to make sure that there is on-site parking. And so the applicant has shown that parking is on this subject parcel. Um, and then in terms of um, work that proceeds without um, prior permits, Sometimes that happens, and yes, you are to look at this as though that's not part of it because the applicant stopped work. Um, the reason why, I, I wouldn't say this happens regularly, but it does happen where people start work and they don't have the appropriate permits. Um, in fact, you all just reviewed a permit a couple within the last couple of months for um, a single family house that had an accessory dwelling and the applicant actually moved to expand it to that really um, this sort of straddles the definition between accessory dwelling and now two full now that we allow two family by right everywhere even in the suburban districts um, this became more of an issue where the applicant actually had already started making the second unit that was much bigger than what we had previously only allowed is a 900 square foot unit. Um, but the building department said stop work and that's the mechanism to make sure that applicants come into compliance. So anytime there's a, um, an issue where there's non-compliance or building or is proceeds without the right permit, the mechanism to stop that is to say, you know, you have a stop work and you can't proceed until you get the, your right permits in order. That doesn't mean you're barred from getting those correct permits. It just means you can't continue until you seek those. Now, if there wasn't a path forward to um, obtain the appropriate use permits, then the building commissioner would act and say, you need to undo what you did because there's no path forward to get to where you want to go. And clearly that's not the case in this situation. So it just means that things were a little bit out of order. I guess I otherwise um, would just jump in and say that I think that um, uh, shared driveways and reducing parking are both things that are, um, you know, in support of the city's sustainability goals and things that we we like to see otherwise. Um, so in that way, I, I I support that this project features both of those and um, uh, for safety reasons as well as um, you know the city's sustainability goals. Um, I'd like to just comment that I'm um, inclined to support what's in front of us. Um, I mean, neighbors are tricky um, and neighbors with shared driveways are even trickier. And it is, um, you know, we're required to have three parking spaces and, you know, it looks like there could be four or potentially five. So there are additional potential areas to park. Um, but I think this to me comes down to, um, you know, responsible and respectful neighbors and um, being respectful of your neighbors and not parking in their driveway. And that's not something we have a purview over. You know, that's, that's you know, neighbor management kind of. Um, and I wouldn't be in support of delaying um, before the ZBA because this isn't the kind of, um, um, site review plan where we're going to put 20 conditions on it that might um, come in contrast with something that the ZBA decides. So I, I'd prefer to just check this box and then um, if they decide, you know, they'll decide on their own whether or not to approve this setup. 
but I think being shown what we're being shown, it looks like everything's in compliance with what we have uh, purview to vote on. This, this, I mean, is this, I think of the garages that I have on over my properties that look just like this and I don't think of it, them as having real foundations. Does this have that? To build an actual structure? Um, I'm not sure about how this is constructed, but that's all building code um, requirements. I'm not sure that our building code requirements um, you probably know better than I do whether for residential. I mean, I know we build on that buildings are allowed on slab. I don't know about this, but that's part of the whole building code review. So that would be so. Even if you approved this to be converted to a residence, they'd still need to meet the building codes. Okay. Yeah. I, I just I do think. Uh, the, the reason why I say that is because I, I, you know, one, I, I, I'm inclined, you know, I guess in, it, it goes in the spirit of what, you know, wanting more, more units. Um, uh, but I think that there, we do need to, to think about the fact that as he, as he was saying that there are a lot of garages in this area and those, and a lot of those garages are actually not uh, what I would consider to be structurally good buildings when you actually really look at them. But if you just do, if you're, if all you're doing is a very cosmetic, cosmetic, uh, cosmetic change like this, it will look okay. I just think, especially in the wake of what just happened, and again, I understand that this is more of a building, uh, the building, the building commissioner's purview. But I, I do think we, we should, given the fact that we're going to have a lot of these types of things coming, coming, in front of us, we need to be, uh, we really need to think about that, um, because we we are we're not just saying okay to. Uh, her staying in this house, we're saying that this is going to be a property that's going to be able to be sold and lived in, or not, maybe not sold separately, but but sold and and lived in, and uh, they should be structurally sound. Um, on you mentioned something about the there are a lot of potential garages that could be converted. Just because a garage is there doesn't necessarily mean it's going to meet the zoning requirements for a residential conversion. Um, there are um, some instances where the garages can go for additional permitting, like in this case where it goes to the zoning board, but that's only because the house is pre-existing non-conforming for setback. If there are other um, instances where garages are close to property lines or maybe poorly built and just built as garages, they might not, two things, they might not have the ability to be converted to residential use because it's too close to the property line and there are no other pre-existing non-conformities on the site. And two, um, they um, might um, also um, not be able to be converted because they can't meet the building code requirements for insulation or structural stability or the numerous other I, things I, that um, fall I forward. So I just wanted I to be clear about that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm saying that 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 in in moving forward with 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 these things, I, if we're opening this up, that you know, just like we have DPW on larger projects, make an assessment that says this is this project is is safe to do. We need to have someone say this project is safe to build on. Right, and right because and in like, this there's case, a very good chance that this, this thing has like the, the concrete goes down six inches and and doesn't have a footing. I, I'm. Separate. I mean, maybe we should just take this off past this point, but I'm just saying I, I had 
built with many garages in this area and they just didn't build them like they should have built them ages ago. Thanks, thanks, Sam. But I think that really is kind of uh, around the building code yep. and not in terms of our, our discussion, but thanks for bringing that up. We are gonna see many, many more um, uh, ancillary dwellings and buildings gonna come up before us soon. So we've heard about the parking. Um, Chris, I don't know if there's anything else you wanna add at this point or questions. We could move. No, I, I think the uh, zoning board is going to do the heavy lifting on this project. I think our purview is pretty clear. Okay, doke. And uh, the ch I have no other questions. Is there a motion regarding the application? I move to um, approve the site plan application by Jennifer Pollins for a detached second unit at 32 Maple Street, uh, Florence, map ID 23A-139. A second. All right, the motion's been made by Jana White and second by Mr. Taylor. Any discussion? All right, then we'll move to a voice vote. And Carolyn, due to my technical difficulties, if you would call the roll, that would be great. Sure. Melissa Fowler? Yes. Uh, Chris Kate? Yes. Uh, Sam Taylor? Yes. Jana White? Yes. And George Kohout? Yes. That's unanimous, like the way I count it. Okay, so that will conclude our hearing. I appreciate everyone showing up tonight and your comments, um, especially from the abutters. And I certainly hope that the, the neighbors work out in the future, you know, some agreeable compromises and uses of that shared, that unusual shared driveway. So well, thank you very much. Um, if anybody has any further questions about how this carries out through the ZBA, I'm sure Carolyn would be happy to respond to those during uh, those nine to five office hours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, are there other items, Carolyn, to come before the planning board? Um, we don't have any A and R's tonight. Um, so I did I send you the minutes? I thought I may have sent you minutes from June, I guess it was. Um, you said, yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. So that's all I have. And then oh. um, just a heads up that the August meeting there will be many items. <laughs> Very good. So take a nap there... midday. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Can I hear a motion to approve the minutes of June 6th? I move to both approve the minutes of June 6th and close the public meeting. Well, I think we already closed the public hearing. That's good, Sarah. I mean, Thank you. I, 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 go, I, you go adjourn? To Is that what you're saying? Adjourn. 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 All right. Can I do both at the same time? <clears throat> no. All right, because we, we love these roll calls. And now that my audio is working again, I'm just going to keep talk, talk, talking. Okay, is there any discussion about the minutes? All those in favor? Oh, no, we'll go through the roll call. Um, Melissa Fowler? Yes. And Sam Taylor? Yes. Jana White? Yes. Chris Tate? Yes. And George? Okay, the minutes are approved unanimously. Um, no other last minute things for Carolyn. We're not meeting again until August 12th, I think it is. Yep. Right. So yep. everybody enjoy their long break. Um, and thanks for coming in tonight. I guess a lot of other people are on a break. So <laughs> is there a motion to adjourn at? <clears throat> I'm. I move to adjourn and hey George, call me tomorrow. We'll do, Sam. We have bike racks to talk about. Okay. Yes. Second All right. his motion. Great. All those in favor of adjournment. Melissa Fowler? Yes. All right. Sam Taylor? Yes. Chris? Yes. And Jana? 
Yes. And George, and it's unanimous. Thank you, Carolyn.